Hello, everyone. I am Marcus Sabatello of Daniel Tech. Uh, we are a company here in uh, Vienna, so a local company. We've been working on the topic of decentralized identity for a long time, um, named after the Danube River, which is close to here and very strong these days, but uh, getting uh, getting better. So the idea is um, I can try to give you an overview of uh, decentralized identity. F first, uh, very quickly where that comes from, what we mean by that, but then I, I basically have a a list, a long list, or a, a mix of information about what's happening in this community, uh, what kind of projects, what kind of technologies, what kind of initiatives we have in uh, the decentralized identity community or, or uh, projects that, that uh, work on this idea. Um, historically speaking, so originally when we when we explain decentralized identity, we often show diagrams like that. Maybe you have uh, you have seen that. So basically, at some point. Uh, in communities that were working on digital identity, how you go online, how you prove who you are, um, how others know who you are, how you verify information about someone. So this whole topic of digital identity, at some point there was a realization that the internet has never really been designed with an identity, digital identity layer built in and over time uh, identity, the way how that works, the way how we identify ourselves, how we authenticate, how we verify information has become very centralized. Um, so we've, we've heard about uh, data leaks, about mass surveillance, the, the Snowden revelations, uh, surveillance capitalism, the, the idea that personal data is the new oil of the 21st century, things like that. Uh, on, on the internet, we've seen infrastructures like uh, login with Facebook, uh, Amazon, and, and so on, where our identities, our uh, identifiers, our uh, profiles, our data have become very centralized and controlled by large organizations like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and, and so on. So if I use my Facebook account, for example, to log in to many different websites, and Facebook can track me everywhere I go. And could could take away my could take away my account could uh, track me, and so on. So there was this idea that uh, digital identity should work in a decentralized way, in a way that's more natural how identity works in the physical world, and uh, then we show diagrams like that, right, where my identity me is somehow in the center of my interactions. I am in control what happens with my my data. I am in control when I log in somewhere on the internet. And the term self-sovereign identity was created at some point. So more, it's, it's a little bit more like an ideology, right? Being self-sovereign, being in control of who I am. Um, we've, we've used uh, sometimes very strong metaphors. So we, we call that thing on the left side, we call that uh, digital uh, slavery. And the thing on the right side, we call digital sovereignty or digital enlightenment and, and so on. So there was a movement about 10 years ago. It started to try and figure out how digital identity should work online in a decentralized way. And, uh, and then at some point there were, there were meetings, there were some conferences, there were some early papers to try and find out what kind of technologies uh, are needed to realize this idea, right? So decentralized identity, self-sovereign identity was a, was a concept, was an idea, but then the process started to try to find out how to realize that using uh, concrete technologies. And about 10 years ago, one of the early papers uh, was called Decentralized Public Key Infrastructure. So the idea was that in order to establish a digital identity, in, in order to establish an identity, an account, if you want, when you go online, the process of doing that should be decentralized. It should basically be based on cryptography. So there should be a way how using cryptography, creating private public key pairs, how that should be the root of my identity. And my identity online should not be an account in somebody else's database that, is, that I then depend on. So it was an early paper that, uh, that uh, articulated some of, some of the ideas how digital identity could be established online through uh, basically generating a, a key pair through cryptography as a, as a way of creating a, um, an, a presence online. And um, the roots of that go even back further. I don't want to talk about that too much, but even in, in 2005, there was already a blog post on called Laws of Identity that already uh, articulated some, some of these same ideas. And 
then a pretty famous blog post by Christopher Allen, Principles of SSI, Principles of Self-Sovereign Identity, also lists some of the design goals, um, like an independent presence and contextual identity, uh, being able to control who, uh, what I share in, in what context, in, in what transactions, and so on. And then the process started to uh, create concrete technologies, and that is still ongoing today. And so in the next few slides, I have some um, listing some uh, technical building blocks, uh, standards and uh, protocols and uh, concrete technical developments that have emerged from this idea to, to uh, try and build and, and realize this concept of, of decentralized identity. And it starts with decentralized identifiers. So that's a concrete uh, standard that's been under development now for a few years at the World Wide Web Consortium. The idea is that in order to establish a, a decentralized identity, we first need a decentralized identifier. And an identifier is uh, like a domain name or an IP address or a phone number, something that we can use to name things, to refer to things. And uh, traditionally, uh, identifiers have always been centralized or, on, or are not just controlled by me uh, individually, so a, um, a, a Facebook username can be taken away from me, right? It's not something I control. A domain name, I cannot really own a domain name. I can only rent a domain name and I can, I can lose it over time. So the idea was to create a new type of identifier that does not depend on central authorities or intermediaries and that, I, that can be created in a decentralized way, again, through cryptography, sometimes using technologies like blockchains or other decentralized networks like uh, like IPFS and and others uh, but the the core of this idea is that you can create such an identifier uh, without uh, being dependent on somebody who, who gives it to you right so the idea is essentially it's an identifier that can be uh, created in a in a decentralized way and uh, using cryptography, using pu private public key pairs that uh, are then typically managed using applications such as wallets. So the concept of a wallet is uh, also very important in this, in this community. I, I think there will be more presentations about that today. But this is a, a first step, a start, to have a type of address online, a type of identifier online controlled by private keys that you hold and uh, then this identifier uh, cannot be taken away from you. Um, I, have, I have one more slide about this, so a bit more technical information about this. So these, these identifiers, decentralized identifiers, can be resolved to a, a data structure that's called a, a DID document, which contains a technical metadata about, about the identifier. So it's a little bit like resolving a, a domain name to an IP address, you can resolve these DITs, decentralized identifiers, to, to a DIT document, and this contains mostly public key, the public key pairs and some other technical metadata about, about the identifier. So it does not contain personal data. It's not, there's not my, my name and date of birth and, and things like that associated with it, but it's a, it's a technical process, so you have an identifier and you have associated public keys and some other metadata like endpoints, service endpoints, uh, ways how you can interact with that identifier. But it's, it's only a minimum amount of technical information. And then building on top of that, so building on top of these identifiers, we then have other other technologies. The, the other most important one that you hear a lot when you look into decentralized identity and when you look into digital wallets and, and things like that. So the other main building block is verifiable credentials. So that's now is also a standard at the World Wide Web Consortium. Um, uh, version 1.1 is a standard. Version 2.0 is now being uh, worked on. And uh, this, so this is now a data model and a, and a data structure for expressing and uh, storing and exchanging uh, actual attributes and information about about a subject, about a person, but also about an organization or about about a thing. Uh, let me quickly switch to the to the next slide just to to show an example. So this is what a verifiable credential looks like. It's a piece of information that's 
created, that's issued by someone, and that contains statement about, about a subject. So you can see there is an issuer, and then there is a credential subject, and then there's also a, a type. And in, in this case, what this represents is a, is a degree, it's a, it says example degree credential, and it's uh, issued, for example, by a university, right? So you could think of this as a digital equivalent of a, of a diploma. If you graduate from a university, it has some statements here. It says what, what degree this is, example, bachelor degree, name, bachelor of science and arts. And uh, so this is, you can think of this as a, as a digital equivalent of, of uh, identity documents that you have in the, in the physical world, right? A, a driver's license, a birth certificate, a degree from a university, a membership in a, in a library, membership in a, in a soccer club. So any kind of, and I'll, I'll go back now one slide again. So any kind of, of information that's made by someone, that's attested by someone and made about, about a subject. Uh, so here's some more examples. Uh, government can issue a verifiable credential with my name and date of birth. The university can issue this. The bank can can issue a verifiable credential. So there's there's an issuer and there's a subject, and those are identified by by deeds, right? So that's how it fits together. The participants in in these systems they have these decentralized identifiers, and then verifiable credentials can be issued with statements about about the subject. Um, and it's not necessarily um, a, a traditional authority like a government, right? So I could, for example, using these technologies, I could issue a verifiable credential to each one of you that attests that you attended this session here, right? Or a verifiable credential made by an employer that uh, you're a good programmer or a verifiable credential issued by an Airbnb host about your, your guest, right? That somebody was a good guest in your, in your Airbnb. So it can be really any kind of semantic statement made by anyone about anyone else um, that's cryptographically verifiable. So there's a signature on this. And then the, the architecture that you often see uh, looks like this then, right? So this verifiable credential is then given by an issuer to a to a holder who can then present it to a verifier, this issuer holder verifier model you, you hear a lot in, in this community. And, uh, and so the, the idea is that I hold this right in my, in my wallet, in my device, in my app, on my phone, and I, it can only be shared when I approve that. So the, main, the most important thing in this architecture is that there's no direct connection between issuer and verifier, which makes this approach different from many historical approaches to digital identity. When I, when I use my Facebook account to log in somewhere at a website and share my, my data, then Facebook, also called the identity provider, then they, they're always part of the transaction. They're always involved. They can track me, they can withhold information and so on. Whereas in, in this model, uh, the verifiable credential is given to me by my university, by my employer, by someone else, and then I have it, and then I can share it uh, when it's when somebody asks me for it. But I can also choose uh, to to not share it, right? So that's that's what this is. Uh, that the innovation here. Um, I don't know. Does that make sense? Am I too slow or too too fast? Not sure. But these are the, the most important building blocks and. Maybe the third, uh, so, so one thing to mention only, only quickly, there's not just one standard for that. There's the verifiable credential data model in, at the World Wide Web Consortium, but there are also some, unfortunately, some competing other formats, like in, in IETF, there is a, is, a, is a specification called SDJOT, verifiable credential, and in the ISO standards organization, there is something called the mobile driver's license. These are different technologies, unfortunately, that do mostly the same thing in, in different ways. So I, it, it's, it's a bit hard to justify why those different things exist. There, there are some historical reasons for that. It's essentially the same thing. It's essentially a digital representation of a physical document or, or a state, an identity statement. 
but uh, realized in, in different ways. I, I could talk about that for a long time, why, why that is the case. There are some small differences in, in terms of how semantics work, how you model the, the data, how schemas are handled, how revocation is handled. Revocation is also very important right after a, 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 a identity document is, is issued, it can also be revoked, but that, that would go too far too much into details now. So just to mention that there are different uh, standards that are not so compatible, unfortunately. And uh, and so the, another thing you also need is then a, a protocol, right? So now we have basic identifiers, addresses in a system, the decentralized identifiers, and then uh, we also need protocols. So one of the most popular, so protocol then for actually doing the exchange, right? So for moving these credentials around. If I'm, a, if I'm a student and I receive a digital diploma from my university, I can do that with an, with an app, with a wallet app, uh, but I, I need a, a protocol so that the thing can be issued to me, right? You, you can think of that, that you, you go somewhere, you go to a website, for example, and then there is a button that says, receive my digital diploma credential from, from the issuer, from the university. Or on the other side, on the on the verifier side, that means somebody is requesting information from me. Uh, you can see, you can imagine, for example, I I drive in my car, the police stops me, the police wants to see my my driver's license, and I present my verifiable credential, which is a digital driver's license, to the to the police. Then there's an exchange between the holder and the verifier. But for all of that, we need a a protocol also for moving these around, and uh, the most popular. Uh, standard or, or technology right now is a, a profile of OpenID, uh, OpenID for verifiable credentials and there are a number of specifications. Uh, OpenID has been around for a long time, right? So, so OpenID uh, is mostly known for OpenID Connect, uh, which, which is a, a, a protocol for identity federation, for logging in, uh, for, for single sign-on. And things like that. So OpenID has been around for a long time, but has now been adapted to to support this issuance and and uh, and presentation of of credentials. That's making a lot of progress. But uh, and and these are the, the most important things. Maybe that DIDs, verifiable credentials, OpenID for VC. Uh, you, you hear that a lot. But the landscape and the concept of decentralized identity is really much broader. So there are a lot more developments, there are a lot more ideas that are being developed. Uh, one is, for example, DITCOM. Uh, so that's a, a protocol also for exchanging data, for exchanging uh, identity data, but also for any other kind of, of exchange. So it's a, it's a bit more generic. Uh, it, it's a way of establishing connections. It's a way of uh, building, for example, decentralized uh, microblogging services or decentralized social social networks. So it's a it's a generic protocol um, for exchanging data for conducting transactions uh, based on on these same ideas, based on DITs, based on verifiable credentials. So what you could do with that, for example, just to to make some some something up, some use case, you could build a, a decentralized social network where you can share. Uh, photos, or you can share messages, uh, but in, in or, but in order to see a photo, for example, you could see you you could write a rule that this can only be accessed by someone who can show a verifiable credential, for example, that they are uh, working for a certain company or older than eighteen or something like that, right? So it's a way of of establishing relationships and connections and exchanging any kind of data, conducting any kind of interactions, but with this identity layer built in, right? So by saying, I will, I will share my vacation photos only if you can prove to me with a verifiable credential that you live in the same city or that you are uh, working for the same company or something like that. So just to show that this decentralized identity concept is broader than just uh, exchanging driver's licenses and exchanging uh, diplomas and, and things like that. Another interesting uh, project also I, I will mention is decentralized web nodes. So this also builds on top of uh, decentralized identifiers. It's been getting a, a lot of attention. 
uh, this is the idea that you can have online a certain personal data store or personal cloud is also what uh, what this has been called so it's, it's not it's a it's a, not just saying that you have a wallet application on, on your smartphone and that's where you have your uh, your verifiable credentials and your digital identity but it's built on the idea that you have some place in the cloud some place online uh, that that you control that belongs to you think of it as a, a little bit like a personal dropbox or a personal email email account but more more generic right as a as a place where you could store uh, uh, your calendar or your or a, a playlist for example so one one interesting uh, demo that i've seen with this technology is that uh, people can can build playlists of their favorite songs in a decentralized way so there's no central server and you can share your playlists with your friends or you could share your playlists with everyone who fulfills a certain uh, a certain property right again someone who is in my family someone who works for the same company someone who is now an attendant of this conference right i, I could so I, I could build an application where i upload all my slides into my into my decentralized web node and i set a rule in that decentralized web node that anyone can access and download my my slides who can present a verifiable credential that they are attendants of this of this conference right so a, a digital version of of this if you have a digital version of of your attendee uh, badge in the form of this verifiable credential and we could build an, an application that allows access to certain things or allows communication with a certain uh, applications if you are if you can uh, present such a credential so, so that's the that's the idea to build generic communication to build generic exchange of data in a decentralized way with this concept of, of identity uh, built in. Um, okay, so these were, were a list of some, of some technologies that are, are being developed in this space. Decentralized identifiers, verifiable credentials, OpenID, uh, DITCOM, decentralized web nodes. What I have now is a, a list of some concrete projects and initiatives that are actually being built out there so some concrete developments um, one that you will hear about also today i think in other presentations that's getting a lot of attention right now is the eu digital identity wallet so there's been a regulation passed by the eu parliament eidos 2 uh, which says that in the next few years every everyone living in the eu will have to receive a digital wallet made by the state or or developed by the state or developed by some company it doesn't matter but anyone in the in, in the eu member states in the next few years will have the opportunity to get a, um, a eu digital wallet and that's pretty much what uh, i've been talking about so far right so a, a place where you can store verifiable credentials where you can store these digital identity documents like a driver's license like a passport like a birth certificate and not just government issued things so also a university diploma or a membership in the soccer club and and so on and uh, this will be built in a decentralized way where, the, where there's not one central authority that uh, that controls everything and, and there are a lot of things happening right now there's a technical specification called the architecture reference framework they're going to be so-called implementing acts so these are legal documents official acts that uh, set the technical standards how exactly this this will work so this will take a few years but uh, but it's it's happening and there are a number of large projects uh, so-called large-scale pilots uh, no bid potential dc for eu ewc each one of them are large projects with many with big consortia many participants uh, universities large companies startups and and so on they're all building pilots uh, pilots of this technology right now that last one uh, ewc european wallet consortium for example they are running pilots uh, around uh, travel credentials like a boarding pass on, on the plane or a train ticket or things like that to have these these kinds of documents in a in a digital wallet so this is something a very big effort that the eu 
is driving right now. Um, it also has to do with geopolitical strategic considerations. I think the EU wants, uh, wants their citizens to be independent of uh, American identity providers and Chinese apps and, and so on, so to build a, a sovereign European digital identity solution. Um, I, I have a lot of slides, maybe I should skip over some of them, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, and another big EU project is, is the uh, EPSI, European Blockchain Service Infrastructure. So this is a, a, a blockchain technology. I, I have to say very clearly, have to say very clearly that this idea of decentralized identity is not inherently linked to, to blockchain, right? So there's some connections or the technology I talked about first, the DITS, decentralized identifiers, they can be realized, they can be implemented with blockchain technology, but don't have to be. So there's not a, not a, not a required link. There's not a requirement that blockchain technology has to be used for decentralized identity, but sometimes it is, it is being used. For that, because if you if you think about that, blockchains have two or have a number of properties, which you usually explicitly don't want for identity, right? On a on a blockchain, often everything is fully transparent, everything is publicly visible, and everything is immutable. You you cannot delete something. And for digital identity, like who I am, my name, my date of birth, I don't want that to be publicly visible, and I don't want that to be immutable. So it, it's it's a bit of a difficult topic how that fits together, but nevertheless, the EU has built a large project, EPSI, that, that's in place, uh, blockchain nodes in different EU member states, and is also running a number of concrete projects uh, around that related to decentralized identity. So there's a project called EPSI Vector, that's uh, again a, consor a consortium with many partners, including universities, including social security institutions, they are building pilots to, to build a digital European health insurance card. So your, your health insurance card that we, we have in our physical wallets um, to build a, a digital version of that and the, the Austrian and the German social security institutions, they are part of that um, to, to build this. Um, another big project uh, also Trace for EU is about things and, and physical objects. So, uh, so this whole idea, the, these technologies, decentralized identity, can cannot just be used for people, but also f but also for for things. And they have use cases around uh, uh, verifiable information about seafood, about halloumi cheese, uh, to to track where does that come from? Uh, was was a certain product? created using child labor from, from a place where you, you don't want to import products. Is this really an authentic cheese? Uh, what is the life cycle of a battery to, to model verifiable information about batteries? This, there, there's a whole other big EU initiative called Digital Product Passport, Circular Economy. So this is about the idea that for physical things like batteries, for, for tires in a car, uh, or for uh, textiles, t-shirts and so on, that you can have verifiable information about it. Where does that come from? Can you recycle that instead of throwing it away? So that there's a really a very large amount of use cases. Um, here's a quick example of something that, that we've built. Uh, our, our company, uh, the digital diploma on the left side, you can see a physical diploma of the Vienna University of Business and Economics. And then on the right side, you can see the digital version. And we've run some projects with the Technical University in Graz and Technical University in Berlin to try and to try and see if these uh, digital diplomas can be exchanged. Always in this issue hold a verifier model, right? So the digital diploma is given to the student and they can choose to share it. It's not transferred, it's not stored centrally, it's not mined or sold by anyone. In, in other parts of the world, we also have projects in the United States. The Department of Homeland Security is working on a digital version of a green card, a permanent resident card, if you want to live and work in the US. Um, I have to go, have to go a bit faster, I, I think, because I have so many more 
more slides because it's such a big, uh, such a big topic. There's so many things happening in decentralized identity. Here you see some screenshots of uh, something we've done with the Department of Homeland Security on a digital green card, but they also have supply chain traceability use cases, again, more about physical things. So they, they think that these decentralized identity technologies can also be used for, for uh, trade and for tracing the origins of physical goods that are important, being important, imported into a, into a country. And one thing that's getting more and more important uh, that, that we see is interoperability. So a lot of these projects are being built in a more in an isolated way. Uh, a lot of pilots are, are being built. But as I've also mentioned, there are different technologies. So if, for example, a few universities in, in Europe are building a decentralized identity project or application and in, in America or in Korea or in China or elsewhere, uh, similar projects are also happening. At the moment, there's not much interoperability, so we tried to to work on a demonstration. Uh, we received a grant from the EU for that to to do a demonstration how that can be combined, right? If there's a digital verifiable credential issued in the United States, can that be used and verified then in, in Europe and the other way around? Because what this concept or the, the vision and the ambition of decentralized identity is really about is to create a global foundational decentralized identity layer. It's not about one company building an app. It's not about solving one use case in an isolated way. It's a little bit about uh, creating something that's a, a foundational stack of technology so that in theory at least um, every wallet or every issue, every verifiable credential would be interoperable globally in a similar way as if you have a, a, a web browser, you can also access any website in, in the world, right? You don't need to build some conversion or so. So that's the, that's the idea, but that will take a bit more time, I think. In the meantime, some more, some more examples of what's happening in, in California. Uh, they have issued mobile driver's licenses. So if you're a driver in California, you can download a, a wallet app and receive your digital driver's license in that app, and then you can use it, you can present it. Um, there's an open source project, right? This is an open source conference here. I will talk more, a little bit more about open source projects, but, um, and uh, sorry, going back just a few slides, I forgot to mention that here, this EU digital identity wallet, there's also an open source reference implementation. So you can go there, you can go there today. GitHub EU Digital Identity Wallet. There's an open source reference implementation of the relevant uh, standards and technologies that make this work. And uh, same for this uh, California uh, project. This is in production, so they've issued 600,000 of verifiable credentials to drivers. Um, another thing, uh, Blue Sky, if you've heard about that, a decentralized Twitter alternative uh, uses decentralized identifiers, so uses this uh, this uh, technology where the, basically you're uh, to participate in this decentralized microblogging service instead of having to register an account in a central database. Instead of doing that, you create a decentralized identifier which you control with private keys, and that's that's then your account basically on the on the network. Uh, true age, age verification project in the United States. Um, so this is about uh, uh, commerce. If you go to a supermarket, uh, you have to prove your age if you want to buy alcohol. Um, you can have loyalty cards. You can have receipts for what you buy. So it's about purchasing things in a supermarket. Uh, you can do that here in a, in a project also with decentralized technologies where not everything is stored in a central database. So to prove your age, for example, you use a wallet, you present a verifiable credential that you are over older than 18 or older than 21 or whatever, and that information is not tracked in a, in a central way. And uh, here, just some more historical examples. These were several years ago, but uh, it was a project to, to rent uh, scooters to, to present use, using a digital identity wallet to unlock uh, a scooter that you can then 
rent um, work day a project with employee credentials to model that you, that you are working for a company. The org book is quite interesting because that's about uh, identity of organizations, right? So this whole stack of technologies is not just for persons, not just for things, but also for organizations. So this was in Canada. They issued, so the government issued verifiable credentials to organizations to certify, for example, that they are, uh, 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 that they are properly registered as a corporation or that they are a licensed uh, pizzeria or, or whatever, right? So verifiable information also about organizations. Okay, um, I want to leave a bit, some time, a little bit also for questions, I guess, but I have another block of a few slides, I think uh, four or five or so of uh, communities and organizations where this all of this is being developed. So W3C, I, if you want to get involved, right, if you want to learn more about decentralized identity, what are good places for that? World Wide Web Consortium is one organization where a lot of the standardization is happening. If you want to read the technical specifications, there are also some groups like this one, Credentials Community Group, that's very lightweight to, to access. It's a mailing list. You can show up there. You can ask some questions about the technologies. So that's a, that's a good place for learning about some of the standards. Uh, Decentralized Identity Foundation is a is a non non profit uh, international non profit uh, with different working groups that are all trying to figure this out right so there's a lot of, a lot of things that still have to be uh, discussed and and so on there are working groups to talk about identifiers to talk about credentials uh, also to talk about concrete uh, use cases banking finance hospitality travel healthcare. Health case I wrote, okay, healthcare. Um, also local uh, chapters of this organization in Africa, Japan, and, and so on. So that's also very easy to, to get uh, access to, to ask some questions, to start working on things. Um, Trust Over IP Foundation is, is another, there are a lot of foundations in this space and sometimes it's hard to know which one is doing what. But this one is, is trying to solve a little bit the question of human trust or how do you know who is behind a certain interaction, right? How do you know that a credential that you're being offered now, if there's a, a button on a web page that, that offers you a verifiable credential, how do you know that this is really a, a bank or a university, right? So this, this organization is trying to, to model the, the human trust uh, behind decentralized uh, technologies. Um, also task force related to AI and, and metaverse and, and how decentralized identity fits in with that. I, identity and AI is another huge topic, I, I think. So, that, so there's also a little bit happening in this organization. Open IT Foundation, I, I mentioned already, um, yeah, is working mostly on the, the protocols for exchanging uh, digital identity data. Um, like I said, this organization has a long, long history. So for a long time, they've they've worked on, on what used to be called user-centric identity, and and now, decentralized identity. And um, yeah, this one, of course, uh, this is a Linux Foundation event, right? Linux Foundation Open Source Summit. Uh, yeah, what I forgot to mention actually. Some of these uh, Trust Over IP Foundation and Decentralized Identity Foundations are actually foundations under Linux Foundation. So they are part of Linux Foundation, just like, just like this event. And in Linux Foundation, there are many, many projects. And recently, some of them have um, converged or, or combined their work in uh, what's called Linux Foundation Decentralized Trust. Um, so this is something like an umbrella foundation that uh, bundles and uh, and combines several initiatives and several open source projects. Hyperledger Identus, this is an open source project with reusable components for all of this. So if you want to build a proof of concept, if you want to try out uh, decentralized identity things, then you, could, you can look at these open source projects. There are tutorials, there are examples, there are libraries, SDKs, 
you can use uh, hyperledger Aries also is, is, sim is similar. These two are similar, but in different programming languages. There are libraries for cryptographic tools. I haven't talked about that much, but uh, but but the things like zero knowledge proofs, uh, advanced cryptography is also very important in in this community, right? Uh, if I if I have a digital wallet with a with a digital driver's license and I want to prove to someone only a part of that, then I can do that. This is this is called selective disclosure, right? In the in the physical world, if I if for example if I want to enter a, a nightclub or if I want to buy alcohol and I show my driver's license, then I'm showing everything about me, right? My name and date of birth and what I'm allowed to drive, and so on. But uh, in, in this concept of decentralized identity, we also have what's called selective disclosure. So I only have to share what's really required for a certain interaction, right? I don't have to share my complete identity document. I only have to share the fact that I, I don't even have to share my date of birth, right? I have to share only a cryptographic proof that I'm over 18. So I can buy the, the alcohol or so I can go in a nightclub or or whatever, or that I'm younger than 18, right? If there's a social media platform for teenagers and you want um, that to be only for people who are under 18 and, and things like that. So, and there's a lot of cryptography involved, the zero knowledge proofs and so on. And there are also open source libraries uh, for, that, for that kind of thing. So a lot of open source projects in uh, Linux Foundation Decentralized Trust. Then another one, Open Wallet Foundation. I think their executive director, Daniel Goldscheider, will have a presentation later today. Uh, this is also a, a relatively uh, recent uh, nonprofit that's getting a lot of attention and is doing a lot of cool work. They are really focused on open source projects, also open source development for this whole uh, community, decentralized identity, digital wallets, they have uh, frameworks in different uh, and SDKs in different languages, uh, .NET, JavaScript, Kotlin, Python, Rust, and so on. Uh, frameworks, uh, development kits for wallets. Right here again, we have the EU, that is European Digital Identity Wallet. So Open Wallet Foundation has a reference implementation of that as well. So also a great place to, to look at if you want to try out things and uh, maybe build something with decentralized identity. And then there are also some, a lot of uh, startups and company, companies that are to different degrees uh, also building open source tools. This includes us, like uh, Danny Tech is our company. We also have some open source libraries um, and so you can also look at, look at those. This is just a partial list, so there, there are more, but there are also SDKs and, and libraries um, sometimes there's an open core model, right? So there are for-profit companies like ours, for example, we have some open source tools and then we try to also build uh, products around that for, for applications and for concrete, concrete use cases. Uh, Microsoft is not a startup, but they also have some, some, li some libraries and, and have generally been very supportive and, and active in, in this community. So it sounds maybe like a contradiction, right? That a large, large company, maybe they don't want decentralized identity, but uh, Microsoft is an, an example to, of a large company that has very, very much contributed and supported this, uh, this development. Finally, and this is my last slide now, and then we can have some questions, maybe a uh, lot of events. If you want to learn more about all of this, you can, look at some of these events. Um, Internet Identity Workshop has been taking place for 15 years, so they've been trying for a long time, ever, twice every year, more than, for more than 15 years, uh, twice every year, so they've been trying to figure out digital identity for a long time. Um, rebooting the Web of Trust is more like a, co a workshop meeting where you sit down for three, for three days and you actively work on code or you actively write a specification. So this, this one is not about slides and product pitches, but this is about getting together and, and getting some real work done. And then 
number of unconferences, digital identity unconference Europe in Zurich, did unconf Africa next February in South Africa, a decentralized web camp is an actual camp, so you sleep in a tent <laughs> outside and then you have sessions in the morning and uh, work on specifications in the, in the forest somewhere. Um, and, and there are many more, so these are just some, some examples. European Identity and Cloud Conference is the biggest and most, I think, most important event in Europe uh, related to digital identity and uh, that, that one is more business, more corporate oriented. So hope I have given you a quick initial overview of the landscape and all the many things that are happening there. Again, it's just a subset, just a, a snapshot, but uh, because it's a broad, a broad topic, but it's getting a lot of attention now and a lot of big, big initiatives and uh, technical developments. Um, yeah, thanks. Any questions? Does this work? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you briefly touched on revocation before, but what about expiration? I mean, we, are, we have documents here like passports, birth certificates that are supposed to last for decades. And the examples that you have shown only had a valid from date, but never an expiration date. And we cannot assume that the cryptographic uh, protocols that we're using today are still are still going to be considered secure in a, in a couple of decades. Yes, absolutely. So th this example and the other example, they have a valid from date. So when they be when they become valid, which is not necessarily the same as the issuance date. So it's also possible to issue something that becomes valid later. But uh, the, the data model also supports an expiration date. It's just an optional field. It's not in this example, but the standard uh, verifiable credential data model also has, it has valid from and it has valid to. So an, when a passport gets issued, you can include a timestamp when it expires. It's just not in, in this example, but it's absolutely part of the model. But, how, but you will probably need something like re-signatures. I mean, for a birth certificate today, that would, would be, if, even if I have a, a valid to date, that would be 100 years in the future. And that's not going to be a good idea cryptographically. Yes, so um, cryptographic, so to talk about the cryptography, which is not my, my main field of expertise, but you see that there's a proof here with a signature uh, that has a certain crypto suite. So this, is, uh, this uses an, an elliptic curve, EDDSA uh, signature using ED, ED25519 keys, which of course in 100 years may not be uh, secure anymore. In that case, uh, yeah, you could either have an expiration date, so then it expires and then you have to issue a new one and then you can use a different type of, of signature mechanism. Um, or you can revoke it and then again uh, reissue it with a different type of signature. But one thing you can also do, uh, you can also, this is not in the example, but you can also have multiple uh, proof types on it. So there can be two or three uh, signatures, for example, also with a, with a quantum proof signature. So this is being discussed right now, right, as also a, a possibility to, to issue the same credential with different types of signatures, um, potentially one, some more long lasting than others. So as a person interested in this, like from the consumer side, I would like to use it, uh, but didn't look much into it. Uh, is there something I can like try right now, but like from the idea that I like it for the idea that I will have a single valid. And what I looked at stuff is like you have an app that has a valid for this, this thing that people are trying. So is there maybe already something that I can try that is really like the one wallet that will have multiple things in it and then that can interact with other stuff. Maybe, my, I don't know, uh, open ID is something I would be looking for, but I didn't check yet. I'm um, sorry, I'm not sure if I understood all of it, but if, if there is something concrete you can, you can try today. I mean, if you go to, to these organizations like Decentralized Identity Foundation, uh, Open ID Foundation, Open Wallet Foundation, or some of these uh, 
startups and, and companies, you'll, you'll find concrete things. You'll find uh, uh, videos, you'll find blog posts, you also find uh, open source libraries, and you also find apps that you can download uh, today, right? So um, th th there are more than that. I, I couldn't fit a lot on, on the slide, but there are, um, if you go, for example, to Open Wallet Foundation, you'll see a list of members. If you go to Decentralized Identity Foundation, you'll see a list of members, and many of them have have working things. They have uh, they have built uh, real use cases. They have they have apps in the in the App Store that you can download today. They have demo websites. Um, I, I don't want to pick out one right now because I, I don't want to. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, pick, pick favorites or, or so, but there are apps in the App Store, there are websites where you can go today and, and try it out. So I would, I would look at some of these community organizations and you'll, you'll, you should find a lot of working things. Thank you. Um, are there already uh, uh, thoughts about uh, uh, getting biometric data into the whole the system, like your fingerprint, your hand veins or something, or your retina? Yeah, so bi biometrics is also not so much my, my specialty, but usually, usually um, in this, looking at verifiable credentials at, and looking at this, uh, sorry for switching around, looking at this general architecture, usually we, we use biometrics basically for unlocking keys on your, on your device, right? So we, the, the applications and the use cases that I've seen, for example, would not put a biometric here inside the data, right? We would not store, um, I mean, gen generally speaking, you could you could you could actually include a, a photo, for example, in in this, right? So if you if you are a social insurance institution and you issue a, a digital social insurance card, then maybe that that should have a photo on it, right? Then the photo can be part of this. Then it's just another field, another property inside this uh, credential. Um, so principally, it could be anything that's codable in base, uh, base 64 or something to be Yeah, yeah, it could be a base 64 encoded uh -huh. uh, um, image inside this, okay. inside this uh, set of claims. Yeah. Um, what about the sovereignty of the clients? Um, the main beef I have with the current solution in Austria, but to the best of my knowledge, all over the EU, is that you need to escrow your key to some centralized cloud provider and that everything you do with your smartphone only works on a phone that's, that's controlled by either Google or Apple. Is that going to get better with EIDAS2 and the open wallet or is it going to stay like this? So that the core idea is that you control your private keys yourself and that they are stored in your in your physical device and and not in escrow by someone else in the eidas regulation that's not it's not mandatory to do that so in in eidas you you have something called trust service providers right so it, it is possible that this eidas and the eu digital wallet can be implemented in the future in a way where the private keys are not on your device, but are held in, in escrow, but by a European trust service provider, right? So it would not be by Apple or, or Google that would then not be compliant with the EIDAS regulation, but the private keys could be stored in, in Austria, for example, there's a trust, right? As an, as an organization, a trust service provider. So that's possible that it will get implemented in that way where the private keys are not on your device, but in a, in a escrow service, and then it would not be fully self-sovereign according to this philosophy, but it would at least be would at least be subject to European legislation and, and governance. But but you're you're right, right? This deviates a little bit from the hardcore radical self-sovereign idea, um, and and I, I think. The, the talk here, what I try to explain, is decentralized identity, but there will also definitely be. Uh, hybrid solutions and, and things that are a little bit decentralized or more, more decentralized. So there are various degrees of 
decentralization of on, on all levels. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? If not, then sorry for all these many slides. And uh, I think that's it. We have a short break. If, if you have any other thoughts or want to get in contact, happy to hear from you. And uh, with that, uh, thank you.